know what you're thinking. If you have high income, what could possibly go wrong if you want to build wealth? Wealth is the same as income, right? Most of us, myself included, when I finished dental school, think that just because they make six, maybe even seven figures, they'll automatically have it made. But the more I started networking with other doctors and dentists, the more I realized how bad they were struggling. So in this video, I'm going to share with you the eight steps to building wealth as a high income earner. Make sure that you stick around for the last step, which is number eight, which is my favorite. If you're new here on this channel, I'm Dr. Jeff Anzalone, a periodontist that's nothing more but on a mission to get you out of the rat race with building wealth with eight steps. So if you're ready, let's get going. Step number one, you are blessed. That's right. You are blessed. Building wealth as a high income earner, you have to recognize that you know what, you're blessed. Simply, if you live in the US, which probably you do, just living here, this is the land of opportunity, puts you in a much better position to build wealth than those from other countries. Now, if you have a high income, more than likely you've gotten to where you are due to the effort that you put probably into your education, the time, the effort, the energy, and the debt that we go into to become doctors, dentists, lawyers, accountants, and other professions. It's, it's a really big sacrifice and it, you have to really kind of look back on it and it really requires discipline. You know, you've got to have the, you got to have the discipline, okay, to, to sit there and delay your gratification to get to where you are. But take a look around. When's the last time you went into a busy restaurant and you've seen the waiters just busting their butts and getting paid only tips. Or how about the guys that are outside pulling weeds in your flower beds or, or they're laying down sod or they're doing landscaping when it's 100 degrees outside. These people work hard, yet most don't make near the income that you make. So remember, this first step in building wealth with your income is you always express gratitude in that we are truly blessed. Step number two. I mentioned it a little bit when we started this video. High income does not necessarily equal high wealth. Okay, so remember, just because you make good money, it doesn't, mess, doesn't necessarily mean that you're set for life and that you're going to reach financial independence. Income is nothing more than just money coming in. All right, income, money flowing into your accounts. Yes, I understand that you're going to you're going to be able to grow wealth faster, the more you have the more opportunity, the, the faster it's coming into your bank account, okay? But that's just one part of the formula. However, if you don't have the rest of the formula dialed in, all of that income, it all goes to waste. So I want you to, to picture your income as water. And you're basically, you're pouring water into a bucket that's filled with holes, okay? And those holes represent all of your payments, all of your expenses, all of your debt payments. Okay, so you're pouring the water in. So if you're pouring it in and you have a lot of debt, well, you can't pour the water fast enough to start to accumulate any. Perfect example is professional athletes. Okay, yes, I understand that they make a lot of money, but they don't understand, or maybe they've never heard of the proverb that basically states, too much is given, much is required. They're given a lot of money, yet they don't know how to handle it. Okay. According to research, about 16% of NFL players, they actually file for bankruptcy within 12 years of retirement. Another report suggests that as many as 78% of the NFL players, they face serious financial hardships shortly after their retirement. Okay. Perfect example. Well-known example of this is Vince Young, who was a former NFL quarterback. He earned around $26 million over six seasons in professional football. Now, despite all the money that he made, he encountered big time financial troubles due to the due to a combination of several factors. Well, he trusted the wrong financial planner who reportedly misappropriated about five and a half million dollars of his money. Additionally, you know, he couldn't put it totally on other people. Young himself had very, very poor spending habits. OK, all of these factors combined with some other financial missteps, unfortunately, led to his eventual bankruptcy, which leads us to number three, you want to be, you want to make sure that you're very wary of financial professionals. Speaking of financial planners, you want to make sure that you're very, very wary of them. You always want to have situational awareness. What, what is this guy or, or girl? What are, what are they trying to sell me? You know, a lot of times we, you know, high income professionals, we're viewed by brokers, insurance agents, bankers, and so-called financial professionals as 
we're, we're people with this, with this big S on our shirt. Okay. I'm not talking about Superman. I'm talking about super stupid, financially stupid. Okay. They understand that yet, even though that we make a lot of money, most of us don't know what to do with it. We're, we're financially illiterate. And they realize that if they can get to us first, right, right when we get out of our training with, with dinners, with lunches, with social events, then guess what? They're set with the fees that they're going to sell us from all their products and services on an ongoing relationship. I'll, you know what, looking back, I'll, I'll never forget when my grandmother died and I was looking over her financial statements after she passed away, her so-called fiduciary financial planner had her in just tons of stocks. Okay. I mean, page after page after page. And, you know, I'm going through all these dates, you know, going back, she, you know, she was mid to late eighties when she passed away and, and really up until the time that she passed away, you know, going back, you, you know, just, just a few years prior to that, he was constantly making trades on this. And my, my dad was asking, he's like, what would they be doing that for? You know, she's basically bedridden. She was on hospice for like two years, still making trades. He's basically capitalizing on the fees. His, their fiduciary planner was just capitalizing on the fees he was being able to charge the account. Okay. And all he was doing is just churning the account, buying and selling stocks. It's, it's, it's incredible. Okay. But that's what happens if you don't stay on top of where your money's going and who's helping you handle it. Cause if you don't, just like my grandmother, you'll get played. Step number four, how to build wealth as a high income earner. If you have student loans, you want to pay them off student loans, A S A P. Okay. Now, if you're like most people, who have a high income. Again, you've probably gotten there because you've had some student loans. I had a little over $300,000 from dental school in my resident and residency. And initially when I got out, it felt completely overwhelming. Now at that time, you know, you're talking about over 20 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of financial gurus. So at that time, one of the biggest ones was Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey. I was a Dave Ramsey fan then. And we used his seven baby steps to basically go through you know, set up emergency fund, you know, get going, paying off all the debts, debt snowball, smallest to largest. So the debt snowball is where you, you pay off, you, you start with your smallest debt first and you throw all the extra money at that debt. And then you pay all the other debts, just the minimum payment. Now, once that first debt is paid off, then you start with the next one in line and you keep doing this until everything is, is basically paid off. So starting with the smallest one, it gets that little win under your belt. Okay. And then it keeps you motivated to basically tackle the next one. Now, when you get out of school, these companies, these student loan companies, they, they typically automatically will put you on like the longest payment plan possible. I, I don't know exactly what they are, maybe 20 to 30 years. Make sure that if you haven't ever really looked at yours, you want to make sure that you, that you look at them. So I'm speaking from experience, you know, that if you get those loans paid off as quickly as possible, it's really going to allow you to focus on building wealth. Now you're going to hear all, all different types of things about it, but being, being in the position that I am now and knowing what I know now, yes, I could go back and be more productive with, I don't know, not paying off the loans and, you know, putting money, this and that. But you know what? If you get out and you're focused on paying off the, paying off those loans, you can get started much quicker building the wealth. Step number five, you basically, you want to invest until it hurts. You've, you've probably never heard this before, but you want to invest until it's hurt, until it hurts. So depending on who you take investment advice from, they may make a recommendation that you invest like a certain amount of your income. Dave Ramsey's like, I think he's like 10 to 15% of your income. You know, some people may tell you 10, 15, 20% of your income, whatever. And depending on what stage you are in your life, these amounts can change. Now, if you're talking to, let's say a new doctor starting a practice and they have kids versus an established one and the kids are out of the house, that, that's, that's two different conversations. So no matter what stage that you're in, I've had the best luck by investing so much that it's made me uncomfortable. Okay. Now think about this. There's probably like a certain amount. Whenever you look at in your bank account, you probably open up your app. And there's probably a certain amount that you actually need in your bank account to feel comfortable with. Okay. Let's just say it's yeah, 10 grand. Okay. So you look at it and make it maybe like 11 grand one month and maybe like 8,500 bucks, 7,200 bucks, 12 grand, and maybe fluctuate, but kind of average for you, let's say it's 10 grand. Okay. But once that number goes below that set amount, like tremendously, that's when you start to pay attention, right? 
And then you're, and then you're kind of focused on, Hey, I, you know, maybe I need to start looking at my expenses. Maybe I need to work a little bit more or whatever. Okay. Think about it. If, if it's 10 grand and it gets down to like a thousand bucks, you're really going to pay attention. And this is just something that you're going to have to train yourself to do. Then what, what you can do is you can create what's called artificial scarcity. Okay. All right. So the, the artificial scarcity is what I just talked about. So let, let's talk about like a business account. Okay. So let's say that you're comfortable with having like a hundred grand in your, let, let's say that you're a private practice, you're a dentist. Okay. You got a hundred grand in there and you, you got money all coming out to salaries, maybe your 401k, maybe some real estate, maybe this and that paying bills, whatever loans. And basically if you have that hundred grand in there, most of the time you're going to probably keep that amount probably for a long time. Okay. And you may look up and you may say, Hey, you know, like the last seven years, I've had about a hundred grand in, in our dental account. So maybe that's, maybe that's what you're thinking. But what if you made it a point and you started to take half of that 50 grand out a year and invest it? Okay. Again, artificial scarcity, you're becoming very uncomfortable. You're like, Oh God, I got to have a hundred. So you're taking 50 out, you're busting your butt. You're looking at your expenses. You're, you're doing this and that to get it back to where you're comfortable. Guess what? After five years, instead of just having that same, because you would have just had that same hundred thousand dollars in your account, because you you know you kind of look at it and you, it goes up and down a little bit, but uh, you kind of keep it around there. But if you would have done that instead, you likely you probably likely are still going to have the hundred thousand dollars or close to it. But guess what? Fifty grand a year you're taking out for five years, you'd have two hundred fifty thousand dollars to work with to potentially invest with. Why? It's because remember you created artificial scarcity. All right. That's step number five. Step number, step number six is you want to ignore, and I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard of this before. You want to ignore expectations. Okay. One of the biggest reasons that so many high income earners get into financial trouble is because of social expectations or more specifically the pressure to meet social expectations. I'll never forget my aunt telling me one time um, that her and my uncle, who at the time was a dentist, he's retired now, they were living in their first home here in Louisiana. And he'd been practicing for like, I don't know, like two years. And someone delivered a package to them at the door, you know, they rang the doorbell. And they said, and, and they said, well, you know, I came here, but then I left. And then I came back here and realized that, yeah, this, this is the address that you live at. And basically they, they thought they were at the wrong house because they were like, look, this, there's not like many, there's no dentist or doctors that, that live in this neighborhood. And, and that, that comment has always stuck with me. Have, not having anybody live there, it, was, it wasn't expected. They didn't expect somebody that made a lot of money to live in that neighborhood. Okay. I remember getting out of dental school and there was a lot of social pressure here in town to, you know, to join the country club, to buy new cars and to do all the things that all the other doctors were doing. Now I get that living in a, you know, you, you probably live in a small apartment. We lived in a small apartment when we were first, you know, married, first getting out of residency, you live in a small apartment or a little duplex or something all those years while you're in school. And, and then you get out and you start making good money and you, you think that you kind of get entitled to the big house or cars because now what, you, you know, you're making a little bit of change. Now, if that's you, then it's really going to be hard to build wealth with that attitude. Okay. Having that mindset, that entitlement attitude. Now, if you have the YOLO attitude, okay, with $400,000 in student loans and, and nothing in investment accounts, then you're going to have to, to develop the muscle, the, the strong mental muscle to, to ignore all this, all these social expectations, even though the voice in your head is telling you different, which basically leads perfectly to our next step. And that is this, you want to buy just enough house. Okay. So if you talk to a mortgage broker or a banker or something like that, they're likely to tell you how much house you should buy based on your income. Sometimes I may tell you that you could take out a loan, like 40, 45% of your income your take on pay. Going back again, Dave Ramsey, you know, whether you, you like him, you're not, you know, when you're first starting out, you don't really know anything about money. He does give some pretty good guidelines and he recommends no more than 25% of your take home pay should go towards your mortgage. Okay. Now we've been led to believe 
that the American dream is what? To become a homeowner, right? And, and what is the best investment that we're told? The best investment that we'll ever make is what? It's our house, right? Well, I initially believed this too until I learned the difference between what an asset is and what a liability is. If you don't know the difference, it's very simple. Asset puts money in your pocket. Liability takes money out of your pocket. Now, let me ask you this question. Does your house that you're living in, does it put money in your pocket? Nope, it doesn't, unless you're renting it out. And I want you to think about all the, the expenses, all the costs, the, the taxes, the insurance, the maintenance, all that is, all that goes into running and owning a house, running a household. So I recommend that you buy just enough house for your family's needs initially. If I could go back, I would have rented, I would have gotten out and I would have rented as long as possible. I, I didn't even know about all this stuff. I was just ready to get out. But but looking back at the younger Jeff, this is what I would tell him to do. Rent as long as possible, okay? Because here's the deal. Once you're committed to a big mortgage, you're locked into a big chunk of your income going where? Out to the mortgage company, all right? And this brings us to step number eight, which is my favorite. So step number eight is this. And if you've been following me for a while, then you better know what this is. And that is this. And we just kind of mentioned it a little bit on step number seven. You want to invest in appreciating cash flowing assets, not liabilities, but cash flowing assets. So think about it. When you get out of your training, and, you, and you're probably already doing this now, you're probably already on the track for the long haul, what we've been, quote, brainwashed to believe that we have to work for 30 or 40 years. We have to slowly build our wealth with a 401k in the stock market, knowing that it's going to go up and down, knowing that our financial professional, our fiduciary is going to be taking 1%, whether you make money or not. So for every million dollars that you're making, he's pocketing 10 grand a month. Okay. He's got a hundred of you that, that have a, that have a million dollars. He has assets under management. That's a hundred grand a month for doing freaking nothing. Okay. That, that is like the best business model ever. I'm the one that's stupid. They're the smart ones. Right. And we go to school for all this. Okay. So that, that's what we've been told. If that, and that's, if you're comfortable with that, that's great. I was on that track for the first 10, 11 years of my career until I um, basically got a wrist injury. Then I had to think about, well, if I can't use my hands as a dentist, how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to pay the bills? So I had to go through, that was my quote, my big why that, that basically led me to, to relentlessly pursue ways to not only have, of course, you have a disability policy, but if you never fully get disabled, then that's not going to pay all your bills, right? So you're going to, you have to have ways to replace yourself. You have to have other cash flowing assets out there, appreciating assets, they're just going to pay for your liabilities. Pay for your liabilities now so you get to the point where work is optional, okay? That that whole work for the long haul, 401k, stocks, mutual funds, that's called the slow lane. And if you want true financial freedom, then again, focusing on replacing your, if you want to replace your expenses, that'll be even quicker. But if you want to replace your income, again, gradually with assets that are putting money in your pocket. That could be passive businesses. That could be my favorite real estate syndications. Okay. And with, with these passive investments, they allow you to focus on what you do best. If you're a physician, if you're a dentist, if you're whatever, that's going to be your biggest money-making tool is what you did all that training to do. So if you're focused on doing that, making the most money and then taking all that money and what? Invest until it hurts. Take all that money and put it in different cash flowing assets to start paying your expenses. Okay. The, the first time that I did this, I got like a little over 300 bucks that was coming in every month. I was like, man, this is really cool. Did it again. I was like over 600 bucks. So instead of the Dave Ramsey snowball, I was doing the, I reversed it. I did like the passive income snowball. So I, I started replacing my expense. I listed out my expenses, smallest to largest and started replacing those smaller expenses with passive income. So I had something that was paying my internet bill, my cable bill, my gas bill, my electric bill. So, so now I can get up every morning and go, hey, all of that's taken care of. Now I've got a trailer park in South Louisiana that's paying our mortgage amongst other things that are paying everything else. But I'm, I'm still working. I'm still enjoying it and working part time. But again, I want you to get to the point where work is optional to you. And if you stay on this long track, this long haul track that we've been led to believe that it's the only way to build wealth, then think again. And I haven't even begun to talk about, well, that's just like replacing your expenses or income. 
I'm not even haven't even begun to talk about, which I've got plenty of videos on it, about the tax benefits. Because if you stay again on the long haul, you're going to pay the most taxes. Why? Because all of your income is going to be, let's say you're a dentist. Well, all that income that's coming in, it's taxed at the highest rate because that's active income. But if you replace your income with passive income, guess what? That is the lowest tax income there is. If you look at the super, super wealthy people, the majority of their income is coming from all these different sources, but their passive income because they know how to play the tax game. Okay. So I want to thank you for watching this and basically in the line of high income earners. If you like to learn more about the investment advice I wish I'd had back into my 30s, then I want you to check out this video.